November 22nd on the Just Baseball Show. It's the day before Thanksgiving. We've had a little bit of a crowded podcast schedule. I'm currently in Pittsburgh. Arm's been bouncing around traveling. Jack is in the Dominican Republic. So we were recording this Wednesday afternoon. So apologies for you know not getting as many episodes out. This might be our last episode of the week, but post-Thanksgiving, it will be full schedule ahead, and we have a loaded show for you here. We're going to talk about a couple of storylines. The Cardinals added two pitchers. We talked about Lance Lynn a little bit, but adding Kyle Gibson. We're also going to talk about the Padres hiring new manager Mike Schilt and breakout hitters of the 2022 or 2023. It's the offseason. I have no idea what I'm talking about. That's Arm Layton. I'm Peter Apple, and it's all brought to you by BetMGM, the king of sportsbooks. Use promo code just baseball when you sign up and deposit into your newly created account. Download the BetMGM Sports app on iOS or Android, or visit BetMGM.com. Place your first bet offer and receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if it loses. And if that bet does lose, your bonus bets will be available once the wager is settled. Gambling problem? Call or text 1 800 Gambler. Must be 21 or older and terms and conditions apply arm we got a lot to get going so no need to dilly dally no need to catch up let's just talk baseball yeah. you down yeah yeah no, no no small talk on the open here uh i will say i i'm i'm excited to get into these these hitters uh, i think there's a lot of different players that we could have discussed and, and we'll get into that in a second but i think it's really funny that we get to lead off with you know you guys were talking about underrated pitchers breakout pitchers all that good stuff and <laughs> the Cardinals go with two guys that I think are the least likely to be on that list next year. I think they could put together, you know, a, a serviceable season, but you were just talking about it before we hit record. Like what does this rotation look like as of right now? And it's what, if you look at fan graphs, roster resource, miles, Michaelis, Kyle Gibson, Lance Lynn, Steven Matz, Dakota Hudson, Zach Thompson, you, you throw somebody in there. It doesn't really matter to me. Like, I get trying to fill out the rotation. I don't think Gibson's a bad ad because they literally do need five bodies there. You're not going to get five aces, right? You're, it's just not realistic. But to me, this move kind of screams either one of two things. One is a great thing. One is a terrible thing. The great thing is, okay, they're going to go get their ace now. And whether that's a glass now, whether that's a Yamamoto, whether that's somebody else, that remains to be seen. But the other side of it could be, oh, they're pulling an Orioles or they're pulling a Cardinals all over again. Like last year, we we're kind of waiting for them to do it. They've acknowledged that they needed to address the pitching. I hope they don't think that this is what that is. Yeah. And John Roselock sat down with Katie Wu of The Athletic, and he said that he felt considerable pressure to shore up depth early. He said he was identifying individuals that really wanted to be in St. Louis. He thinks that if he didn't sign them now, we would have been left standing. So Cardinals fans, it's the same story. It's the same story that you've been hearing on the show for the past two and a half years since we were project the plate. The Cardinals are not aggressive enough in the starting pitching market and the downfall of the Cardinals over these past couple of seasons have been a lack of starting pitching. Yeah. And they've been interesting in the way that they're going after some of these guys, right? You go after Steven Matz, who doesn't have a history of staying healthy, right? Jack Flaherty, same thing where it's like these guys are in and out of the rotation. They haven't been able to stick with guys that they can rely on, right? Miles Michaelis has been that guy, but other than him, they needed this depth. And what did they do? They went to go get Kyle Gibson, who's routinely over 170 innings. Lance yeah. Lynn is also a guy that say whatever you want about the production. He's making his start every fifth day. So I don't hate both of these moves if, mm -hmm. and it's a big if, it's the same if we keep talking about, will they finally make the move? Tyler Glass now. He has been reported as the most likely pitcher to be traded at this deadline per Ken Rosenthal. He's on the market. Yamamoto on the market. It was reported the the Cardinals were in on Aaron Nola. So, and Moselock has come out and said before the offseason started that they want to add, and I quote, two and a half to three starters. I think you could qualify Lance Lynn or Kyle Gibson, take your pick as the half. So they've yeah. done the two so far. If they then make the move for a guy like Tyler Glass now, I'm sitting back and thinking, okay, a rotation with Glass now, Michaelis, um, Lynn, Gibson, it's at least going to make you more competitive than it was last year. 
Still, is it enough? I don't know, but it makes me much more comfortable going into the season if I'm a Cardinals fan. No doubt. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's like it's hard to judge these moves before we find out if they're going to do anything else. And, and that's the big side of it. I, I think you hit on a really important point, which is you've got to get through the the, the 162. And uh, we've seen Major League Baseball, especially from a pitching standpoint, and a, especially with you know some of the rumblings of whether the pitch clock creates more injuries or whatever, it, it's a battle of attrition on the mound, right? It's, it's just whoever has the most pitching at the end of the season. So having these guys that, yeah, you can really – use as much as possible and eat those innings even if it's at a four two four three era uh, you're you're cool with that if you go get that frontline guy if they were in on on nola and you even imagine that their top offer was 150 160 or, or whatever it may have been uh some said that he was offered more money to you know i don't know john Heyman said that he was offered more money uh to to play with another team but opted to take a little bit less and stick stick in philly then I feel like you could almost bridge that gap and, and get to Yamamoto. And maybe that's why they went with these shorter term deals. They could go get a Yamamoto who's going to cost a lot of money, but it's also going to be a long-term deal. So you can kind of backload that deal uh, and, and have it to where Yamamoto is making a lot of his money when some of these other guys are coming off the books, right? Goldschmidt's only on the books for a couple more years. Uh, Arenado. Yeah. He's, he's going to be on the books for a while, but he's not extraordinarily expensive. And then there's some other guys that'll be coming off the books in the coming years as well. Even that you look at the uh, Contreras deal, it's really not that long term if we're looking at a 10 year Yamamoto deal. So they could backload that you know, similar to the way the Padres did with Manny Machado. I think that's why the Cardinals are, are interesting for me is I think they're going to make that splash. There's no way John Mosellock has not learned his lesson by now, especially when they've said we kind of learned our lesson. And you, you met the two and a half thing is hilarious because I kind of count each of these guys as a half a pitcher. Right? Or, or would, would you count them as would they combine to one and a half? Would you give them 0.75 each? Like I, if they I said think, they're adding two and a half. I think right now they're at one and a half. I think that's yeah. fair. So my, one pitcher, get one stud, and you got your two and a half. Here's my thing, though. The Cardinals are not cash poor. The I Cardinals know. have plenty of money. What was stopping them? We talk about it all the time. They have plenty of offensive prospects. You don't think that they're going to go add offense because that was not the issue for the Cardinals this year. Now, did the Cardinals, you know, in some situations, did they not come up big in the big moments? Of course, like any team does. But we weren't looking at the Cardinals this season and saying, you know what, they need to go add some big time bats. So if they have the money, what was stopping them from potentially getting Kyle Gibson? Okay, that's fine. Depth arm, not a bad move at all and then signing Blake Snell and then trading for Tyler Glass now, right? They have the offensive prospects to do it. They've been in every big-time trade. The Cardinals are always linked to the big-time player, so they have the players to trade. They have the money to potentially sign a Blake Snell, and then you could still get Kyle Gibson. He signed a one-year $12 million deal. That's basically nothing. That's like a rounding error to these teams. So what was stopping them from doing that instead of then you get Lance Lynn, and then it's like, well, we have to get the ace now, and if they don't get the ace, they're left with their thumbs up their butts, yeah. realistically. So I just don't get them playing it safe. And Mosellock even said he wanted guys who want to be in St. Louis, and that was a big-time key for them right? They were trying to identify players who identify with St. Louis and Lance Lynn. He responded to AJ Pruszynski and he said, I'm an hour and a half from the stadium. I can sleep in my bed every night. And this was said on the foul territory show. It was a no brainer for me. Yeah. Okay. I get it, but come on money. You're talks. the Cardinals. If yeah, Blake yeah. Snell offered, was offered a big time deal with them. I think he'd identify with St. Louis because yeah. the money would be there, right? So I I'm just like sick it... of the Cardinals playing this act like they are the Tampa Bay Rays or that they're this small market team. You are the St. Louis Cardinals. You yeah. are second in Major League history in World Series championships to the New York Yankees. You are not little brother. You should be yeah. the prohibitive National League Central champion every single year. And instead, the Cubs are making moves. The Brewers, I don't know, but they're going to win 86 games, even if they have you and me playing on the infield. The Reds are getting better. The Pirates are getting better. And the Cardinals just stick with their ways. And these ways are just not working, Arm. 
Yeah, and I think that's why they're going to swing for the fences here. They have to. They have, they have to. to. So I keep saying they're going to swing for the fences. Like, how many times have we said that? I know, but there's no way you can look at that rotation and say, like, okay, that's that's the two and a half we needed. They but looked I'm, at the rotation last year and did the same shit. I know, I know. And then they said, oh, all right, we miss, we we kind of misidentified our situation. Let's see. I, I will say that you, you bring up a good point. I hate the I hate the argument of hey you know we have guys that might not want to be here like we we are specifically targeting guys that want to be here you know what's a really easy way to make people want to play for you give them a ton of money like you said with Blake Snell if you offer them more or close to what all these other other teams are offering you'll get them if you're the St. Louis freaking Cardinals the Marlins on the other hand they offered Justin Turner a little bit more money I don't blame him for going to Boston makes a lot more sense better fit I'd rather be there too but when you look at the St. Louis Cardinals man it, it shouldn't be a sell, a tough sell. And I know they're not trying to brand it like that. They're saying they want guys to specifically, you know, fit with the Cardinals and with some of the clubhouse things that they dealt with last year. I get it, but come on. I mean, that's just, that's a cop out for a team that, you know, should be, like you said, spending with, with the best of them. And they don't really have any major financial commitments beyond 2025, aside from 27 million to Nolan Arenado, which cuts to 15 in 2027, by the way. And uh, the 18 million a year for Wilson Contreras, which is up in 2027. So come on, backload it, go sign somebody big and, and let's watch this team finally get a shot, you know, with, with this offensive core that I think is still really fun. Is John Moselock just going to waste years of Paul Goldschmidt and Nolan Arenado? Like those windows are not going to be open for that much longer. You got them. You want to win a championship. You have Jordan Walker. You have a lot of good players on offense. All you have to do is shore up the starting rotation. So I think both of us are in the same boat. We're not going to judge them yet. However, no. it is easy to judge them and seeing the puzzle pieces being put in the exact same place they were last year, the year before that, and every year since John Mosellock took over as the general manager. You and I more me, I just get angry about whatever, but I get angry about the Cardinals because it's the same thing over and over again. It's like, you don't want to repeat past mistakes, doing the same thing over and over and over again. And that's what makes me so upset about the Cardinals, but I'm not going to judge them yet because Tyler Glass now is a perfect fit with St. Louis and they still have enough money to even go get a Blake Snell while getting these two guys. So we will see, but the Padres, they made a new hire. They promoted bench coach Mike Schilt to be their new manager after Bob Melvin left to go to the San Francisco Giants. Arm, I was looking at Mike Schilt's managerial record. It's pretty damn good, right? First yep. season with the St. Louis Cardinals, right? He starts late. He goes 41 and 28. Then in 2019, the team goes 91 and 71. Then in the shortened COVID season, goes 30 and 28. Then in 2021, he wins another 90 games with the St. Louis Cardinals. He now has a 559 winning percentage as a manager, but he was ousted because he's old school. And I like Mike Schilt. I like the hire. What say you? I mean, it's similar to the Bob Melvin hire, right? So I think they're they're kind of trying it the same way again, see if he fits a little bit differently and in the same way. Um, I, they loved Melvin. I, it just was kind of a, a circumstantial thing there. So I think it's a good ad. I mean, how many other managers are you going to have that are 252 and 199? I mean, it's a 560 uh, winning percentage there. I, he's obviously done some good things. He's managed some superstar players. And we were always curious as to why things fizzled out and, and he was let go. That was one of the more surprising uh, you know, parting of ways, I think, on the managerial side as we've seen in, in the last few years. So it was kind of only a matter of time before he got another opportunity. And I think he's the right guy for this because he's, he's an advocate for his players. We've seen that in the past. He's willing to go out and you know wear it in front of the media. And, and I think he's a guy that can kind of handle everything that's going on there in San Diego. And uh, I think has a good feel for the team situation and, and the managing of egos there, which is ultimately the most important thing. I don't think it's going to be as much about pushing the buttons, the right buttons with that team. It's more about you know, managing the egos and, and keeping that clubhouse intact, which, you know, is, is tough when you've got all those different personalities in there. I'm just surprised that, you know, teams like the Mets or, you know, teams like the Angels hiring Ron Washington, but Ron Washington more falls into the same bucket as Mike Schilt, you know, the Astros promoting their bench coach, all these different things. Like, 
I I guess you can make the argument that we'd rather try the new thing than the guy who's been around. I could see that in some specific situations. But in this situation, a guy who has had a winning record every single time he was a manager, but then was let go because of organizational things. Why Schilt wasn't one of the top guys for this job over guys with no experience so yeah. far. Well, That's what I, I just don't understand yeah. comparing guys like the Mets are hiring the Yankees bench coach with no experience over Mike Schilt, who only has good experience. It's not like he's flamed out and he's had horrible seasons and he's known well, to be a bad guy, but he's been around for 20 years. No, this is a guy who had four seasons, all with a winning record, but just never got the same look. Yeah, I think the Mets want a guy, you know, with Stearns, like a guy that, you know, they can kind of control a little bit and, and have it come from the top. And then we know the Angels love their their old heads and their, and their older managers. But and, how well does that normally work when the general uh, manager basically is just, you know, playing? I don't, what's that Pinocchio thing where he's playing the I, strings? Of yeah, I, w- I wish we knew, like, because if we knew every team that kind of does it and doesn't, I, I think a lot of teams do it with success. And there's, there's a balance of it all. But what's interesting with, with, with Schilt is – yeah, I think he's somebody that just kind of fits what they what they need. I don't think they need anything too complicated here. So I, I like it. I think I think he's the perfect fit for them. And uh, at the end of the day, like they they parted ways over what was cited as philosophical differences. And the philosophical differences, whatever those may be, I mean, the Cardinals finished in the last last year. So uh, I think whatever Schultz philosophy was can't be worse. So I, I'm interested to see what that looks like in in San Diego now with him at the helm. Absolutely. Time for breakout hitters. Let's do it. So I have five American League hitters. Arm has five National League hitters. On the last episode on Monday, Jack and I went through the pitchers, brought up a couple of bullpen arms. And I think it's a little bit easier for pitchers to kind of have that breakout year. Like there's just more of them than on the hitting side, even though, of course, there's more hitters. But Arm, you and I deliberated, right? Should Corbin Carroll make this list? Probably not. Should Gunnar Henderson make this list? Probably not. Were they breakout hitters because it was their first rookie season? Yes, but that's not really the point of what we're doing here. What we're doing here is identifying players who didn't have much of a track record going into the season and burst out or more journeyman type, right? Like I'm going to talk about Brent Rooker of the Oakland A's. Right. Is Zach Jeloff a guy who was a breakout hitter? Absolutely. But it was such a short sample. We just need to see more. A guy like Brent Rooker, he's been around for a while and this was more of his breakout season. So it's a perfect guy to get started with. So Brent Rooker of the Oakland Athletics put up a 127 WRC plus. He debuted as a 25 year old in the Minnesota Twins organization and was out of the Minnesota Twins organization by 2022, played with a couple of teams, only registered, right? I'm looking at games played here. He only had about 80 games under his belt before the 2023 season with the Oakland Athletics, where he hit 30 home runs, slugged 488, hit 246. So he wasn't a guy who hit 210, but just hit a couple of bombs. He's going to have his strikeouts, but he did post the highest walk rate of his career. And let me take you back to April. In the last 20 seasons, there have only been two players who had a better April by WRC plus than Brent Rooker 225 WRC plus the only two players to do it was actually one player who did it twice that was Barry Bonds in 2002 and Barry Bonds again in 2004 that's how electric Brent Rooker was in the month of April and I was reading a Sports Illustrated article about Brent Rooker and and I quote what helped him this year What was important to me, I was still finding ways to put the barrel on the ball and hit it hard, despite hitting some good pitcher's pitches. And I've kind of figured out if I kept that same swing, same approach, when I got a little more hitter-friendly pitches and pitches up in the zone, I'd be able to do damage. And that's kind of what happened. And it's exactly what happened. He posted the highest hard hit rate of his career at 49.5%, hit the living piss out of the ball all season long, didn't hit the ball on the ground, kept the ball in the air, and hit hitters pitches stayed in the zone didn't let counts get away from him had a 
relatively decent approach, cut the strikeout rate earlier on, start striking out at the end of the season. But I look at a guy like Brent Rooker, if he's making good swing decisions, he knows his swing at this point in his career at 29 years old. Could he be a guy that the maybe new Las Vegas A's or current Oakland A's can rely on to say, yep, you're not going to hit 270, but if you hit 230 to 240 with 25 to 30 bombs and you walk a lot, you're going to be a valuable player on our team. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. What he kind of perfected was, hey, I'm just not going to miss fastballs. And he really didn't. I, breaking balls were still a challenge for him. Uh, at 23 of his, what, 30 home runs came on fastballs and 312 batting average, 632 slug uh, against fastballs, but, you know, struggled a little bit. Again, 141 batting average, five homers on breaking balls. But if it's a hanger, you're still able to catch them. What's interesting to me is like that's something that over the course of the year, right? He's playing every day, he played 137 games. And the, the league has that scouting report. They adjust. And and he had a little bit of a lull. Uh, they started spinning him more. They started throwing him more heavy fastballs at the bottom of the zone. And then the season progressed, and he made that adjustment back. And we saw down the stretch of the season, he got hot again. And, and over his final 30 games, had a really nice finish where he hit eight home runs, had an OPS uh, over 850, I think just at 862, and just continued to rake. And that's in a really crappy environment to hit, which is a really important part of it too. Like That's one of the worst places to hit out there in Oakland. Like The ball just does not fly. And it's also just endless how big and how much space there is out there. So just I, I think add, that side of it is really impressive. Just to add a quick point to that too, think about it. The pitchers aren't dealing with noise because nobody's there. So they can lock in as well. So you already have a tough hitter's environment in terms of the park. And then on top of it, you got a pitcher who is fully locked in against the Oakland A's. But I'm glad you brought up the um, the fact that he went through a little bit of a lull. In pre-All-Star break, 826 OPS hit 16 of his 31 home runs, 30 home runs. But post-All-Star break, 806 OPS, same batting average, 14 bombs. So the league adjusted to him, started throwing him more breaking balls, and then he adjusted back. That's why I believe that this might be sustainable. Do you... If I set the over under next year on a 115 WRC plus and 25 home runs, would you take the Ooh. over or the under? Mm. Uh, that's really tough. That's a good you one. Remember, WRC plus accounts for the park. So he's yeah. always going to get a little bump by playing in Oakland. Yeah. Mm. I'm going to take the over. I'm going to, I think this guy's kind of just figured himself out. Like, this is what he's going to be. You got to take the good with the bad. And uh, you're going to get 33% K rate. You're going to get 25 to 30 homers. I'll, I'll take the over, but I think it's going to be right there. Yeah. I think that's a good line. Shout out to me. Let's get up yeah, to your, your great line. Your first guy. Uh, kind of building off of the same thing you were talking about earlier, where it's like, okay, rookies are all technically breaking out in the major league ranks because it's their first taste of the major leagues. I wanted to really build it and we wanted to build it around what, what the expectations were, right? We were expecting Corbin Carroll to be the rookie of the year and he was the rookie of the year. Was he even better than that? Of course. But again, it's not that full fledged breakout when you're the number one prospect in baseball for us. And just you're baseball. coming off a season where you had a 135 WRC plus in a limited sample in the major league. So we already proved that he could hit. And got that like, you know, hundred million dollar deal. So yeah. it's, it's, it, there, there's just so many things that go into that. So for me, I'll start with a rookie that, I think really exceeded a lot of expectations and that's Nolan Jones because Nolan Jones uh, with the Colorado Rockies really didn't slow down at all. And I was expecting like, okay, when does this shoe drop, right? When is Nolan Jones going to finally slow down a little bit? Former first round or day one pick with, with the Cleveland guardians Indians at the time and uh, gets traded in kind of a 40 man crunch last year. And it's because he really was kind of hot and cold and I just couldn't quite completely get his feet under him in the minor leagues but what he did this past year was absolutely insane and and just seeing nolan jones which i think you could talk about the park you could talk about the, the fact that it's yeah of course it's easier to hit in Coors field and and that's a, an environment that definitely benefits a power hitter like him this guy posted a 135 wrc plus and it's like you mentioned park adjusted and beyond that made such big strides against lefties. That was something that he really struggled with in the minors. 2019, I think he hit like a buck 50 against left-handed pitching, really had like consistent splits this year. But you got 20 home runs in 106 games. You have a 297, 389, 542 slash line, a 135 WRC plus, walked at a 13% clip. Yes, he's going to swing and miss. He had a 30% K rate, but 
again, that's palatable when you walk, when you have a high bad because of how hard you hit the ball. And yeah, there might've been some, some batted ball luck there uh, overall. But I think when you look at the course of the season, it's pretty hard to argue against what he did. And again, a guy that just continued to get better as the season went on. I know he's technically didn't debut at, you know, on opening day. So the first half, second half splits are a little bit skewed. You got 69 games in the second half. You got 36 games in the first half, but the guy hit 289 through the first half hit 301 through the second half and the power never really waned at all. And he also hit really well away from course. So I think that's an important note in this too. Like this guy just point blank hits and I love his weird golf grip. Uh, I'm, I'm sold on that hits the ball in the air. He hits it hard and he, he has a pretty good approach in terms of just being able to lay off his stuff outside the zone and, and draw his walks. That's always been a part of his game. Yeah. And he's a guy with a little bit of speed, right? Stole 20 bases as well. And I just wanted to quantify what you were saying about how he hits well away from Coors Field, right? 928 OPS at home, right? Hit 306, slug 530. And you'd expect a little bit of drop off on the road, especially in your first year going back and forth between Coors Field and then away games dealing with that altitude. But on the road, his OPS was higher. 934 OPS. He actually slugged at a higher rate, 554. Now the batting average was a little bit low. Same amount of home runs away from Coors Field and at Coors Field and actually had 15 doubles compared to only seven doubles at home. So this is a guy that I think Rockies fans can kind of gather around and be like, hey, you're really a hitter of the future, right? Because he's also a pretty damn good defender. Now, the range, like outs above average, he was negative five, right? But he's always going to get dinged, especially in Coors Field, because the outfield is so vast, right? It's not a perfect stat. But what we do know is that he set the, not the highest, right? Because Brenton Doyle, his teammate, threw 105.7. But if we're looking at arm value and arm strength, he was in the 100th percentile of both, while also being in the 78th percentile in sprint speed. So he's going to learn that outfield in Coors Field, become a better defender he's already got the arm and I think he's got more than 20 home run pop right because you said it yourself in 106 games he had 20 home runs if he plays a full 162 with another year to prepare right we don't see a guy like for example Brent Rooker right hit 144 against against breaking balls Nolan Jones hit 317 against breaking balls so he's just going to keep getting better I would not be surprised to see him be a 280, 290 hitter with 30 bombs and 20 steals. Like this guy might end up being the most underrated player in the entire sport. Hey, he's up there. He's only 25 and, yeah. and 90, 90th percentile exit velocity, 108. Like that's, that's going to play. That puts him in the top 5% of the game. And then uh, on top of that, again, the, the strides left on left are so big. I mean, this guy had a, an OPS almost around a thousand in the big leagues left on left. That, that's absolutely huge for his just outlook in terms of being an, an everyday guy. So I, I'm excited about him. And and I think that the Rockies did a really good job of, I I, I like Juan Brito who they traded over to Cleveland. And, and I think that's a, a guy that's going to be a good prospect for them in the middle infield. But uh, Jones is someone that's a big part of, you know, the, the Rockies future here. And, and that's exciting. Another guy who's a big future, big part of the future of their team, probably the future. And yeah, I'm cheating a little bit. But I just have to talk about Bobby Wood Jr. Bobby Wood Jr. was just unbelievable this year for the Kansas City Royals. 30 bombs, 49 steals. I'm going to say that again. 30 bombs, 49 steals as a shortstop. He put up a 115 WRC+, plus, which is not where we want it. But WRC+, plus, as we know, they love when you walk. And Bobby Wood Jr. doesn't really walk. But what he did do is he did up his walk percentage from the previous year by a full 1.1% and lowered his strikeout rate. So his strikeout rate last year was 21.4%. This year, 17.4%. He was just an incredible hitter for the Royals this year. And this is coming off a season, remember, And expectations, this is why it's kind of cheating, right? He hit 20 home runs and stole 30 bags last year, but he did put up a 98 WRC plus and a 2.3 F4, right? Hit 254. Wasn't the type of hitter. While we did have expectations this year, I don't know if anybody penciled in 30 bombs and 49 stolen bases. And I know this is breakout hitters, but I really want to talk about 
one of the biggest changes we've seen in baseball in the last couple of years is Bobby Witt going from arguably the worst defensive shortstop slash third baseman in the game to arguably the best, which what brought his F war from 2.3 in 2022 to 5.7 this year, one of the league leaders. So I read a bunch of articles about it and I want to read you what I found. So Witt basically rewrote his defensive approach, right? They brought in a couple of hitting coaches. They brought in fielding coaches and they just worked with him nonstop. He worked with private infield coach, Nate Trotsky at a hitting facility for two days of intensive training. And Witt said he was doing a lot of things that weren't normal. He was making plays way harder for me than they'd ever be. I appreciate the focus on the mental side of the game. And then they brought in Jose, I just don't want to butcher this last name, A-L-G-U-A-C-I-L, basically took a different approach, putting him back towards the basics, a lot of first step work, a lot of work on catching the ball in the glove, a lot of work on moving his feet. So Witt basically likes both of them, right? So one side, they're running him through the ringer, making the mental approach like putting a stranglehold on that one, but then also working him through the basics, right? And that back and forth, that allowed Witt to be and to kind of uncover his potential because he has so much. That's why, Arm, when you were ranking him at the top of the prospects list, you didn't think that the glove would be this bad because he just has too much talent. He has too much arm strength, too much speed, too much athleticism to be a defender like that. He got in the lab this offseason, and became one of the better defenders in our sport while hitting 30 home runs and stealing 49 bases. We just have to talk about how incredible Bobby Wood Jr. was this season for the Royals. Yeah, and I will say, if if we were factoring in defense, I would have definitely had uh, William Contreras on on here as well, um, just in case anybody like sees that and they're like, oh, well, what about William? He had a huge jump in F4, and it's pretty similar. I think they were almost clones of each other in terms of, we saw Contreras rake and, and then we're like, okay, well, how's the defense going to come along? And it came along and he turned out, you know, a a similar type of season. Uh, But with Bobby Wood, I mean, it it just seemed like all aspects of the game were clicking for him. And it's, it's important to note. I mean, this is a guy that flew through the minor leagues as a high school draftee uh, in, in 2020. So I I think that side of it's really uh, fascinating as well, where it's like, he kind of continued his development in the big leagues like last year was a 2022 was a developmental year and it seems like 2023 was that year where he can really show what he's capable of and and who he can be and i still don't even think he's a finished product like there's there's more there but i like him as a breakout guy because he went from young player with exciting tools to guy that i expect a lot of people to be i think he could be a trendy mvp candidate pick i know it's gonna be hard with the royals but i think there's gonna be some people that are gonna love the plus whatever thousand odds you're gonna have from bet mgm that you're going to get on a player that could easily go 40, 40 next year with great defense at shortstop. If you do that, you're going to be in the MVP conversation, no matter how bad your team is. Absolutely. And the fact that he has played 308 games in two seasons, he's only missed 14 games. And in those 308 games, 50 bombs, 79 steals. This is guy with the new stolen base rules is going to be in the 40 to 50 steal range. Maybe more as he gets better. Why can't he? He's one of the fastest players in the sport. He has an argument for the fastest. He's got tons of power, right? We just saw 30 home runs. Why can't he unlock more, right? When you were doing your original prospect write-ups, what was, I guess, the ceiling of power that you thought that Witt could deliver? I think I had plus, almost plus plus. I think I had plus plus on him. I think I had 70 raw. Uh, on him so I mean that's 40 bombs I mean if he's 40 50 with incredible defense it's not looking at an eight win player yeah no and and that's that's possible and imagine if if he he just walks more and if he just walks more and he's not striking out anymore I mean we're we're on the precipice of one of the best players in our game Royals fans got to be just ecstatic now the rest of the team we can talk about it but you yeah. do have the best pitcher in baseball in Cole Reagans and hmm. yeah, I don't know we'll and see Vinny Pascantino the goat coming back off of injury but yeah as you mentioned the walk rate slightly improving cut the chase rate by five percent so yeah, as he continues to trend in that direction I I think he's going to be a problem and he's going to only be 24 years old next year who's your next guy 
Next guy is someone that I did not expect to do anything near what he did last year. And I think is a true breakout in every sense. It's TJ Friedel, Cincinnati Reds. I, 138 games last year. This dude, he hit 18 home runs, which is you know, more than he had hit at any level of the minor leagues previously. But beyond that, a 116 WRC plus, he slashed 279, 352, 467. It's a really unique swing. Uh, he starts you know, open, his hands are up in front of him. It seems like he's almost still loading by the time he's swinging, but he's athletic and he just makes it all work. Played great defense overall, too. I know we're not focusing on that, but a 4-4 F4 is, is always going to be of intrigue. And he swiped 27 bags. I think just seeing what Friedel was able to do, considering that he's 28 years old, it was his age 27 season. Uh, we we saw him a couple years in AAA, put up slightly above average numbers. He just kind of seemed like the fourth outfielder type uh, by every stretch. He showed some decent things in 2022. Uh, you know, we saw a .6 F4 in 72 games. He hit 240, uh, but it was just a totally different player in terms of the production. You know, we saw the slugging percentage jump by 30 points. We saw the on-base percentage jump by almost 40 points. We saw the batting average jump by uh, 30, 39 points. And then, of course, the more home runs, stolen bases, and better defense. Friedel was an awesome player. A <laughs> 4-4 F4, you're taking every day of the week. And, I mean, it, it was just really fun to see a guy that I don't think anybody expected anything close to this from uh, do what he did for a team that was one of baseball's most surprising ball clubs. Shout out TJ Friedel got an MVP vote <laughs> and deserved it at that. A couple of things uh, that I wanted to touch on with TJ Friedel against lefties, the dude was one of the best hitters in baseball, slash 354, 421, 542 with a 963 OPS against righties that did drop to 785. And he was another one of these guys who just took advantage of his home ballpark. Great American small park, 926 OPS at home, 724 OPS on the road. And it had a lot to do with the slugging, right? 11 doubles, six triples, 13 bobs at home, 11 doubles, two triples, five home runs on the road. But at worst, and this is why I like TJ Friedel, just wanted to bring those up. He provides a lot of value even when the bat isn't working, right? He's a great base runner. He's a great fielder. He's not going to strike out. He's going to walk enough for it to matter. And then if he can tap into the power, he can get an MVP vote. But even if he doesn't, he can still be a valuable player across the field. That's why I'm a fan of TJ Friedel. Yeah, I mean, we've seen it with the Cassiano splits in Cincinnati and, and some other guys. If you can just be decent on the road, you use 750 OPS on the road, hover around there, and you ball out at home. You're going to finish the year with an OPS over 800. That's exactly what Friedel did. Uh, and, and I think he's somebody that I, I do wonder how much impact is going to be there long term. And uh, you, you could say that it, there's a question of how how much he can maintain what he did. But the batting average on balls in play was not that high for a contact oriented guy at 308 with, with good speed. And, uh, you know, I, I honestly just think he's got a feel for being able to find the gaps and then sneak some balls out to the pole side uh, when he gets the opportunity to. He's just a savvy hitter at 28 years old and another one of those like later 20 breakout guys that are always fun and, and exciting and easy to root for. My next guy is Jack's favorite player, or at least one of them, Isak Paredes of yeah. the Tampa Bay Rays. So if we remember, Isak Paredes was dealt in the Austin Meadows deal, Tigers and Rays, and he was not a good prospect with the Detroit Tigers, or at least he didn't make much of an impact. First two seasons, 2020 shortened season, he only played 34 games. 2021 only played 23 games. Posted a negative F4 in both of them. Now he gets to the Rays, and he shows a little bit of life, right? The guy only hit 205, but he did walk a ton. He didn't strike out. He had 20 bombs and had a 116 WRC+. plus. But this is why it was a breakout year. In 2023, Isak Paredes was one of the best third basemen in Major League Baseball. Put up a 137 WRC+. plus. The batting average goes from 205 to 250. The slugging goes up 50 points. The OBP goes up 50 points. And he hits 11 more home runs, giving him 31 bombs and 98 RBIs while playing solid defense. Now, he's an interesting case, right? Because for a guy with 31 home runs to put up hard hit rate, of 28 and a half, that is very, very low, right? So he's a guy, you look at quality of contact, ex-Woba, Woba. Did he deserve everything that he got? Maybe not, right? 
but he has extremely, extremely good plate discipline. He's a guy who's routinely in the 90% zone contact rate. So he makes up for not hitting the ball very hard with excellent swing decisions, great plate discipline, and waiting for his pitch, and also getting the most out of that contact quality while keeping the ball in the air, posting one of the lower ground ball rates at only 31.6%. And when he got a fastball, he did not miss it. Dude slugged 546 against four seamers. And overall, right, wasn't great against breaking balls, but was good against off speed and just waits for his pitch, gets it, knows himself, and had a really great year. Will he at 31 home runs next year? Maybe not, but he's a guy who's not going to strike out. He's going to walk a ton, and he's going to make enough contact to matter. And remember, Right now, he's 24 years old. He's yeah. got a lot of time to even grow with the Rays lab. Yeah, he could he could tap into a little bit more impact. But to your point about cutting the ground ball rate by 11%, almost a 10.5% is, is absolutely huge. And just somebody that figured out how to squeeze out every drop of that power. If you look at the spray charts, every home run is to the pull side. And, yep. and a lot of them are like hugging the line down to the pull side. You get the hitters count, you hunt something that you can lift to left field as a righty and you don't miss it. And if you can do that, you can hit more home runs than almost any other player with your exit velocities do. And I don't think that there's a player uh, with anything close to his exit velocities that are hitting 30 home runs, right? He's a 90th percentile of 101. That's actually below uh, yeah. MLB average and he's hitting 30 you know, plus home runs. Like that's something that you don't really see often. Um, and, and I think it's a testament to his ability to just backspin baseballs, lean into the pull side and and leverage his counts well. The bat to ball skills, I think, are a really underrated aspect of him, as as you mentioned. I mean, to have the zone contact hovering around 90% is, is awesome, especially when you're geared for lift. Most guys that are contact oriented, flat swing, a lot of a lot of line drives, ground balls, all that good stuff. You think of Luis Arias or somebody like Stephen Kwan. With Paredes to have the zone contact the way he does and hit the ball in the air uh, and, and not miss four seamers while you have a swing that's kind of grooved for lift, that's really impressive. And I don't think he's going anywhere anytime soon. 25 doubles as well. like that. that that's going to play. And I also like, too, that he's not one of these righties that, you know, just kills lefties and then but you face more righties, right? And you kind of falter. No, he, he had an 860 OPS against right-handed pitching. So it's not a splits issue, right? This isn't just a guy who feasted off some soft tossing lefties, got his numbers up, and but overall, three days, four days a week when you're facing righties, he's faltering. No, he was good against righties, and he's a guy that the Rays have right now who I'd be excited about now. Could, is an 840 OPS that he put up this year, is that going to be what he does for the rest of his career? Probably not, but he's going to walk enough and he's going to hit the doubles and he's, I think he can still maintain a 450 slug. I think the 350 OBP is what we'll see from him at 25 home runs. Good enough defense. It's a good player, especially at this young of an age. And maybe he exceeds what I'm talking about. Maybe he starts hitting the ball harder. And with those swing decisions, with the great plate discipline, we could see even more. So he's a really exciting guy. No doubt. And, and I, I get why Jack Jack loves Paredes. And he, he had some prospect to trade back in the day, but, you know, uh, just kind of faded and and just didn't quite have that that area of the game that you could really get excited about. All of a sudden, taps into some exciting game power. But the guy that really tapped into some juice this past year and it was was originally really signed as a defensive guy and has blossomed into a nice bat is, is Hassan Kim. And I know Hassan Kim, if we compare numbers across the board, Probably one of the lesser offensive seasons of all the names we're going to talk about here because he finished the year with a, a battle, I, I think would say WRC plus about 112, 749 OPS, but just such a big leap for him because I felt like we didn't quite know if he was ever going to be able to provide even, even this much offense. And, and it seemed like he might end up being kind of that glove first guy that accumulates war and, and just kind of hits league average, but he did a lot more than that. And, and I thought, through some stretches was fantastic and one of their best players 17 home runs so ups the home run total by six the stolen base output was just ridiculous right he, he more than triples that from 12 to 38 and also walks at a higher clip uh, we see him kind of keep the strikeout rate in check despite you know 
tapping into that more power. It went up a couple of ticks, but it's not really a big deal. But when you see a jump in batting average, you see a, a jump in slug and you see a jump in on base percentage, uh, that's going to qualify as a breakout to me. It might not be the most dramatic breakout, but it's a guy that just made these marginal improvements across the board. And you combine all of those and you get a 4.4 F4 season and, and you get a really well-rounded output from a guy that hit the ball a little bit harder last year and just seemed to get more comfortable in what was you know, his third taste of a big league season and where he's just progressively gotten better. So he's slightly similar to Isak Paredes in the sense of he gets the most out of the lack of contact quality, right? Another guy, 26.7% hard hit rate, just doesn't hit the ball hard. But if you're not going to hit the ball hard, wait for your pitch. Don't chase. Take your base. Get on. Steal. Play great defense. So for a guy who lacks that, he does everything else at a very high level, right? If you're not going to hit the ball hard, walk 10%. Well, he walked 12. If you're not going to hit the ball hard, don't strike out that much. He didn't, 19.8%, right? So for all the people expecting, you know, well, I want to see him at 25 home runs. He probably will never do it. But if he's 10 to 15 with 40 bags and great defense, like that's a phenomenal player to have on your team. Swiss Army. Yeah. Yeah. And a guy that I think is a big glue guy for them going into this coming season. And, you know, it's, it's on a pretty cheap deal and will be very coveted in free agency come 2025. My next guy, JP Crawford of the Seattle Mariners. Um, he was a guy who was a tippity top prospect with the Phillies, right? Like I remember Liz seeing him in the top five. And when he came up with Philly, he just kind of struggled, right? From 2017 to 2018 with the Phillies, never posted a WRC plus above 95, never posted an F4 above 0.6. 2019, he goes over to Seattle. It's a lot of the same story, just the offense was not there for him. He always walked at a high rate, never really struck out, just didn't make enough contact and enough quality contact at that. 2021, we kind of start to see something, even though the offense doesn't fully kick into gear, but he still put up a 3.3 F4, kind of falters in 2022. But this season, man, 134 WRC+. plus. The guy hit 266 with a 438 slug and 380 on base percentage with 19 bombs, walked almost 15% of the time, didn't strike out. The swing rate and the chase rate, the lowest of his career leading to the highest walk rate while still making really good decisions within the zone. That more patient approach. And when you factor in the highest hard hit rate of his career, the lowest ground ball rate of his career, good things are going to happen for you. I feel like this is a guy that was just kind of a late bloomer, right? I believe in the bat now, if he's making these type of swing decisions and hitting the ball hard enough, getting lift on the ball, driving the ball through the gaps, while playing the good defense that he kind of always has, right? Even though, funny enough, this year was one of his worst defensive years, but still putting up a 4.9 F4. I think in age 29 season, we're going to see one of the better shortstops in the American League. I'm very high on J.P. Crawford next year. Which is really funny because I I hated that extension when they gave it to him. I right, five years, fifty one million. I'm like, Ugh. you know, I guess it's it's not bad in terms of the the money, but you know, what are you gonna get from this guy? You know, it's 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 good defense. How much is he gonna hit? Blah blah blah. I, I really didn't like it, and he basically said you can shove it right with with what he did last year. I, I kept waiting because we we've seen the stretches. We've seen the torrid month of J.P. Crawford where everything's on time, he's in rhythm, and it just seems like he's he's barreling everything. And then he looks as cold as ever. And, and we just see the numbers just catapult you know, back up and then back down, and then some somehow finishes the season around a 700 OPS. Didn't happen this year, right? He finishes with that 818, uh, but you mentioned the swing decisions. I mean, walking with the best of them is, is something that really helps when you don't have uh, a ton of, of production in the past. But he also hit the ball pretty hard. He, he snuck out some some solid EVs. You'll get a 90th percentile of 104. You know, that's a couple of ticks above league average. League average is generally around 102. Uh, so, I mean, that's one side of it. He makes plenty of contact. He's above average in that department. And you mentioned the chase rate. I mean, at 18% chase rate, that's 
among some of the lower figures you're going to see out of an everyday player. So it seems like this guy just put it all together offensively. I know he went and worked with driveline. I know you went and, and, and tinkered with some things to be able to tap into some more power to the pull side and not lose that adjustability with the swing. And it's exactly what he did. Uh, that was, he was one of the biggest surprises for me this year. Cause I, I never thought he'd have an 800 OPS in him. I'll, I'll be honest. What do you think about him next year? Like I'm pretty high on him. I think he's kind of figured think- it out. And yeah. I think he's just going to get better defense. Like I don't see a year where he puts up negative eight outs above average. Like I just, I think it was a weird year. I yeah, and, and there's I, guys like one of him, those numbers I just can't believe in. So if he's even just, an average defender with this type of offense, like he is a very very good shortstop. Yeah, there's guys like that too. Where like I just I know he makes all the the, the plays he needs to make, and if the metrics don't love him, like it's you look year to year and sometimes they love them. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes it's positioning. I trust JP Crawford's glove. And even if the metrics tell me it's not great, I'm, I'm still going to think he's, he's playing good defense. 881 OPS over his last 70 games. It just, he seemed to get better and better as the year went on. I think Crawford's going to be really solid next season. And uh, I, I think, yeah, like you mentioned, I just kind of found something 35 doubles as well. He, he's just, he's just kind of found what works for him. And that's a, a top 10 shortstop potentially in this game or a little bit better than that. Surprised he doesn't steal bases. Only had two. Wish he stole like ten. What yes, thirty fifth percentile sprint speed. <laughs> yeah, just kind of a kind of a slow guy. No wonder yeah. the range isn't there. Is that a new narrative? JB Crawford's slow. I mean he he hasn't had a sprint speed above fiftieth percentile since twenty twenty one, and in twenty twenty he was below that too. He's never really been that fast, which is interesting. He's also the most. Like he he's listed at six two two hundred. Are we sure? <laughs> ah, <laughs> but he was like five ten one eighty. I mean, these happening. guys, you see them in person, you're like, whoa, okay, yeah, not, like I you're way you were bigger. Like, yeah, you're way bigger than I thought. But yeah, I mean, it makes sense. He gets into some balls. He he can hit the ball pretty hard. I'm pro JP Crawford. Who's your next guy? Next guy for me is is another rookie that I mean just couldn't have been on anybody's radar, right? And that's James Outman. And we talked about him on the call up a little bit as a guy that could come in and and maybe plug into the outfield, be a fourth outfield type, have some hot stretches where you feel really good about you know him being a plug-in guy. But in terms of being an everyday player, I think there were even questions about that after Outman had his out of body experience experience through the first month or two of the season and then hit the wall where he just was really struggling. But the way he came out the other side of it, and that's kind of the trend here, right, is some of these breakout guys, you're trying to validate the the breakout. It's being able to rise back up again when you get knocked down, and, and that's exactly what Outman did. But the numbers overall in the season, a guy launched 23 home runs. He slashed 248, 353, 437. It's a 118 WRC plus, great defender in the outfield, swiped 16 bags on 19 tries. Yes, he's going to strike out. You got to deal with it. He's going to strike out 30 plus percent of the time. Did that in the minors. He's going to do it in the majors. But he hedges that with walk. He hedges that with some power and some good speed. And and again, the defensive value that you get there. But what I really liked about about Outman and and his finish is the fact that I thought the narrative was already kind of being developed. That was, oh, he had that hot streak. Now that the game adjusted to him and he's going to come back to to earth and, and be that fourth outfielder type. Well, that narrative kind of got put to bed pretty quickly once he heated up again. And if you look at his WRC plus in the second half, 137 in that department. So overcomes that lull and really just ends up going off in the second half, ups the walk rate by almost 2x. He walked at an 8% clip in the first half, 16% clip in the second half, cut the strikeout rate by 5%. So you have better counting stats, you have better uh, a better OPS by over 100 points in the second half, and you have lower strikeout rate, higher walk rate. I mean, Outman's going to be a streaky hitter. Like that's just going to come with the territory, but I think he's proven that he can hit enough at the big league level to be an everyday guy. Yeah. I was the one who fell for that narrative. Um, He gets off to a really hot start. Then he has a really tough May and June, right? Um, 552 OPS in May, 551 OPS in June. And I, or bad in May, bad in June. And I thought to myself, all right, this guy strikes out so much. Yeah, he's going to play good defense, but he's just not a player that, you know, I think is going to be the player that ends the season, right, with a 790 OPS, right? I thought it was going to be lower. I thought he was going to strike out too much. But he really just kicked it back in gear. 
right? July, 905 OPS. August, 890, right? September, 772. Just kind of kept hitting for the rest of the year and definitely put that narrative to bed. And when I look at his everything that goes into James Allen, right? Because we're talking about breakout hitters. But he's so tooled out. 88th percentile sprint speed. Incredible in center field this year. Nine outs above average. He walks a ton. Yes, he strikes out, but he hits the ball relatively hard. And overall, even when he's not fully hitting, he's valuable in center field. So even with the lows, Dodger fans, when James Altman is striking out twice every game and he's putting up a 550 OPS, he's still giving you value in center field. And then when he's on, which was way more months than he was off in really his first full season, and he was this good, He's a guy I can get behind. I fell into the narrative that he wasn't going to make it after those first two bad months, but he did exactly what you said. He told us to shove it. Me. Yeah. It was me. <laughs> and and it's fun because he's a really fun player. And I think a part of what what they're building there. And, and the last thing I'll say is you know, probably you say everyday player, generally bulk platoon, I'd say, because you shield them from lefties, and and I think that's probably what what they'll do uh, with the way that the Dodgers are want to approach this. You know, maybe platoons with Taylor continuously at some point, or or somebody else that can take the left left on left at bats away from him. Six sixty OPS against lefties, but against righties, again that was well over eight hundred. So that's another side of it to just keep the K rate in check and you know get the most out of him value wise and offensively. And uh, I, I'm excited about Outman. I think that the Dodgers found a nice little piece here that not a lot of people were paying attention to uh, before he debuted. My last guy, if you could do it in one word, it would be finally. But it just seems like that. My guy is Spencer Torkelson of the Detroit Tigers. Hmm. And the reason I say finally is because in his first full season, I was expecting him to hit the ground running. This is a guy who's drafted first overall out of Arizona State, is one of the best college hitters I've ever seen with my eyes. And I thought there was nothing that could stop this man. Does he play good defense at first? I don't know. I didn't care. I just thought he, I bet on him to win rookie of the year. I thought he was going to hit 30 bombs, hit 280, and just be one of those bats that never dies. Doesn't matter if you got the best pitcher on planet earth. Doesn't matter if you got the worst, he's going to hit everybody. And what did he do? Really disappointing. Hit eight home runs in 110 games, 75 WRC plus at 22. And I wasn't high on him going into the year. And that was on me just because my expectations for him were so much higher than really any rookie could deliver in their first full season. And he's playing in Comerica. It's cold. He's a warm weather guy adjusting to the cold. And it just didn't click for him in year one. In year two, I don't even think it fully clicked for him. And he still had a very good year. Dude, at 31 bombs in one of the most pitcher-friendly environments. Now, the batting average is still not where I want it to be. The OBP is still not where I want it to be. But the fact that he still was able to put up a 107 WRC+, plus, walk near 10%, strike out 25% of the time, those home runs I think were important, and he only missed two games all season long. I think this is now the beginning of Spencer Torkelson. So what was the big change from 2022 to 2023? Well, his run value against fastballs was negative eight in 2022. He hit 175 and slugged 292. We finally saw what Spencer Torkelson should be with a run value of plus five, hitting 265, slugging 512. He stopped hitting the ball on the ground, but the zone contact went up. A hard hit rate skyrocketed 41% in 2022, 50.9%, which puts him in the 94th percentile. Spencer Torkelson was built to hit the ball hard and hit the ball in the air and do that often. He didn't do it as often as as I would have liked in 2023, but he did it often enough to make this list and, again, make me fully buy in next year. I just think the bat is one of the best young bats in our game. It's just got to click, and we saw it start to click. So he's not a full breakout, but we needed to talk about him. Yeah, I mean, I, the, this is another dude that you look at where he's at it feels like oh when is he going to figure it out when is he going to figure it out this guy flew through the minor leagues he barely played two seasons in the minor leagues and then gets up to the big leagues and we're expecting him to hit the ground running and 
it kind of finishes his development in the big leagues in, in a lot of ways. And then gets this second full season here where we get to really see him build off of what he was able to kind of learn through the mistakes of, of 2022. But the interesting thing is like, he's 24 years old. This was his age 23 season. If you told me Spencer Torque was in age 23 seasons, going to hit 31 homers, 34 doubles. You know, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm taking that even, even at the time that he was drafted, like, yeah, I hope that there was a little bit more in, in the, in the walk department and, and the batting average department as well. But that said, like, this is still so early in his career. And I think he's going to be a guy that just continues to get better and better and better. And to do what he did in, in the second half to, to really seem like he, he figured things out for himself, despite, you know, a lot of pressure on him, despite you know a lot of expectations on the top pick and one of the best college bats we've seen in, in some time, 816 OPS post all-star break that'll absolutely play. I watch him go nuts you know, at Yankee stadium where it just seemed like he just was, was locked in on another level and, and through that stretch, just finished the season. So, so, so strong. Um, I, I think Torkelson's got it going. Yeah. You know, him, Carrie Carpenter, they've got some pieces there that I think you can feel very confident about uh, being able to contribute consistently for them for the foreseeable future. And this is a dude that you're, you're a fly ball hitter in Comerica. Like you got to really hit them and you know, you're going to, Deal with some bad batted ball luck, right? He is a fly ball hitter, 34% ground ball rate. He hit he hits the ball really hard at 90th percentile, 106. But the batting average on balls in play was 270 because it's a hard place to hit. So you got to kind of just deal with that and you know hope that he's able to maybe find the gaps a little bit more, uh, sneak balls out to the pool side a little bit more. But he's got the power to leave the, leave the stadium to all fields. So I, I think it's something that's going to continue to develop for him too. Uh, I think he's going to be a monster this coming season. I'm glad you brought up Kerry Carpenter because I wanted to add Kerry Carpenter to this list just because you and I both love watching him hit all season long. But I was like, is did he break out this year or is he just really good all the time, right? In 2022, 795 OPS, 811 OPS this year. And he's just going to keep getting better. So he didn't qualify as the breakout guy, right? He didn't go from a 75 WRC plus to a 107 and, you know, upping the home run totals by 20, right? Kerry Carpenter is just very good. So- we're not not including Kerry Carpenter because we don't think that he's a great hitter. He just didn't break out. Like I'm just yeah. very high on Kerry Carpenter. And when he hit the ground running, he just keeps hitting. So that's why Carpenter didn't make this list, but Spencer Torkelson did. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Carpenter, you, you, like you said, kind of in that first stint set the bar a little bit higher for himself through that stretch. Uh, the guy that is kind of a cop out for me in terms of the National League, but I, I I wanted to include him because he's presently a National League player and his numbers in the National League were way better and just continuously unreal. Jake Berger, Miami Marlins, that's my final breakout guy because what Berger was able to do this year, I, this is someone that even when the Marlins made the trade, I was like, ooh, you know, this is someone that's kind of standing on his head right now. Is he going to be able to? keep this going. He's an aggressive hitter who hits the ball as, as hard as anyone. I mean, he absolutely scorches baseballs, but he swings a lot. He doesn't walk. He's super expansive with the approach. And I'm like, okay, he might get picked apart. Eventually the, the Marlins are buying on a guy that hit 25 home runs in 88 games. Like, is this going to continue? He's hitting 214. Like, those are all the things I'm thinking. Well, in 53 games with the Marlins after that works with Brant Brown a little bit. And the Marlins hitting coach who actually just left for greener pastures and was able to kind of rectify the bat, the ball department too, while not compromising the power. And with the Marlins in 53 games, it's 303, 355, 505 with nine homers in those 53 games. So over the course of the season, you have 34 bombs. You have a slash line of 250, 309, 518 to 828 OPS. And all of a sudden you're like, this is a really damn good hitter. And this is the Marlins' best power. This is Marlins' best power bat by by a good margin, and honestly, he's becoming a, a really impactful piece for this Marlins team, uh, and that they needed really badly. So it was cool to see him have that success, kind of break out in the home run department with Chicago, and then with Miami to continue the power output, but also be able to start to hit for average. Uh, and that to me is what really, really, really stood out, and. I'm I'm excited about Berger. I, I know there's going to be some some streakiness, but he is definitely a stud. And I think the Marlins have have a good one here. If I'm the Marlins, I am one thousand percent keeping the five dollar Berger, Jake Berger, when they're in Miami. When he was in Miami this year, just home games, right? Hundred plate appearances, 
dude slash 385, 445, 93 to give him a 1,033 OPS. Keep the burgers. Keep Jake Berger. With a guy's approach like this arm, like you watched him all second half, it's a lot of boom or bust. Are you leaning next year more towards boom? Like, do you believe in this or little flash in the pan? What do you think? I don't think he's a 300 hitter, um, but no, you, I also don't, don't think, think he slashes, he's a, you don't think he slashes 385 in Miami next year. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if, if, if the Arias effect rubbed off on him to, I don't think it's permanent, but I will say, I mean, I think when you hit the ball as hard as he does and, and you continue to just get better and better and better as the season went on and, and they were playing some, you know, high stakes games down the stretch and just, I mean, this is a dude that 90th percentile, I'm going to cite it one more time, but this is one of the best figures in the sport, 111 miles per hour. I mean, that puts you in in, in the boat with yeah, within shouting distance of Aaron Judge and, you know, a, a healthy John Carlos Stanton and like some of the top, 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 top power bats in the game. So I mean, when you hit the ball that hard, you're just, I just feel like your floor is elevated and then continue to cut down on the chase. That's that's my one big concern, though. Guy swings way too much. The chase rate of 38% this year. And yeah, yeah, it went down a little bit as the year went on, but that's something that he definitely needs to, to kind of cut down on. But the bat to ball getting better as the season progressed when he was a guy that teams were game planning for, you know, a little bit more. I think that's really encouraging. I I, I think he's going to be a little streaky, but I, I think it'd be shocking if he doesn't hit 30 home runs next year, just because it just seems like that's, that's at least the, the floor for him. I don't know what the average or the OBP is going to be, but I know that he's going to hit 30 home runs. And I do think that he's made strides in the batting average and OBP department to be at least serviceable in those areas as well. 34 home runs. He had more yeah. home runs than walks. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a crazy stat. Like that that's can't happen stat. when you're a power bat. Like I, that's my only concern. But that's something that's generally easier to improve, right? It, it just... It, Cutting down, shrinking the zone a bit. I think the fact that he was that aggressive and and still kept the strikeout rate at twenty seven and a half percent is is pretty impressive. <laughs> just, it actually is pretty impressive. <laughs> just just cut down the chase, and if he does that, I I, I think he could be he could be a scary scary hitter. Because we, I mean, he's also a first round pick, right? Drafted out of Missouri State, eleventh yeah. overall in the twenty seventeen draft. This guy was always known for hitting, and he goes over to the Marlins, and he still hit right. 23 home runs or 25 home runs with the Chicago White Sox. Yeah, he hit 25 of his 34 with Chicago and comes over to Miami. Not an easy park to hit in and still crushes nine in a limited sample. So those are the 10 breakout hitters. Of course, if your guy didn't make this list because he didn't break out, we were perfect. Nah, it was a perfect nah, there's list. a bunch of breakout. There's guys. a bunch of breakout guys. As you know, let us know in the YouTube comments. This will probably be our last episode of the week. Jack, it's hard to get him locked down in the Dominican Republic. Arms traveling. I'm traveling. We'll be back on our normal schedule three days a week next week after Thanksgiving. I hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving. And in the meantime, why not subscribe to YouTube? Why not? Why not? It's a big red button. It's free. You can like videos, comment videos. You can watch all of our interactions on video. But if you're listening on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, we really, 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 ugh. We really, really appreciate you if you could leave five stars, maybe even a written review, and then get yourself some Just Baseball merch. Like, why not? What's stopping you, right? It's sick merch. It's all in the episode description. That's Arm. I'm Peter. Have a great Thanksgiving. And with that, thank you, everybody.